How y'all doing? <clears throat> I'm Joshua Wiley, and this video right here, um, I'm kind of excited to do. Uh, I was supposed to do it last week, and and I know the enemy has definitely been trying to hold me up from doing it. But anyway, let's get right to it. The video is called Ellen G. White Exposes Pope Francis, the Jesuits, and the Illuminati. Now, you know, and it hit me while I was at work one night, why why I needed to do this. You know, uh, a lot of people who believe anything they hear on the internet before doing their own homework, they uh, might Google Seven Day Adventist or Ellen White and they hear, oh, she's a cult or, you know, the, you know, she witchcraft and all this crazy stuff. You hear all this crazy, crazy stuff about Ellen G. White. Well, in this video, I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you why you hear that she's a cult or why you hear it's, it's witchcraft or all of these things, these negative things that you hear about Ellen G. White. And just to get to set the record straight, Ellen G. White did not found the Seventh-day Adventists. I, I was born in Adventist and I studied every religion with just the three main religions when I was 12 years old to find truth on my own. And I didn't read my first Ellen G. White book until I was 29 years old. Until I was 29 years old. Then once I read her for myself for the first time, I actually got I got mad. I was like, man, I should have read her a long time ago. But anyway, anyway, you know, the Holy Spirit works through many means and many people. And and she's one. And she's one. You have all of these people nowadays who claim, oh, I'm a prophet this and prophetess this and prophet that. But how much of this stuff is really valid? You know? How much of it is really valid? The same woman, just, just for a little background on Ellen, and like I said, the truth loves investigation. The truth loves investigation. How many, how many of those same people who call themselves prophets or prophetesses, you know, uh, just say like uh, the health message of today about vegetarianism, veganism, she wrote, the majority of the health message that people follow today, vegans and vegetarianism, uh, about meats and cancers, she wrote about all of that back in the 1800s. Matter of fact, open air sanitariums with big windows, having fresh air coming in, uh, where uh, fresh water and fresh air and even washing your hands, that came from Ellen G. White. I bet you didn't know that. A lot of doctors used to never wash their hands even during surgery, they might come straight from the bathroom, straight in there doing surgery. But Ellen G. White was one of the first people back in the 1800s. She wrote and said, washing of the hands is of utmost importance. Even about tobacco, tobacco causing cancer. Did you know that the doctors used to give their uh, patients who came in with breathing problems, used to prescribe cigarettes? And Ellen G. White even said back then, cigarettes causes cancer. Do not give them. They are bad for you. They kill you. You know, did you know? Just just, just for a little knowledge. For uh, those who like cornflakes, I like cornflakes. And Special K, uh, John, I think it's John Kellogg. Well, anyway, the man who created cornflakes, one of the, the best known physicians ever, said he was so precise with a scalpel. You know, he was worldwide famous. Guess who sent him to school? <laughs> Ellen G. White sent the one of the in the top five of the greatest physicians of all time. She's the one who handpicked him and sent him to schools and said God was behind it. And they paid for his school and sent him to school, uh, sent him up in Battle Creek, Battle Creek Mission. And now all almost all the hospitals in America, yes, are modeled after how she said we should set up hospitals and sanitariums. But they won't tell you this. They will not tell you this. Why? There are, there are reasons why the devil wants you to think that Ellen G. White is crazy. She's a cult. She's this and that. But what, remember, they accused Jesus of the very same things. And what did Jesus say? He said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Remember, they tried to say he was casting out devils by the devil because he was the devil. So he was casting them out. And he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Because I'm going to tell you, there's, and, and, and it makes so much common sense. 
once you look at it. The main reason, and this is what we're going to deal with today, other, like I said, other than her health message, which was beyond her time. You know, now remember, just for an extra little background on Ellen G. White, she only had a third grade education and wrote hundreds of books. She is the most translated author in history, meaning her books have been translated in all all the language in more languages than any other author in history and one of those is steps to christ and if you go to u.s uh i forget the name of our big library that the u.s congress over in the congress in dc but when you go to dc in one of the the, the u.s buildings and the book that they have about Jesus' life. If you ask them, uh, we need a book on, I think it's the Library of Congress or whatever that's called. But if you ask them, we need a book on the life of Jesus, they give you an Ellen G. White book. Now, and that's funny being that it's the government who tries to blackball her or say that she's a cult and there's specific reasons why. I mean, and, and most of my friends on here, most of y'all who are my friends on here, despite, uh, our differences in denominational beliefs. We are brothers and sisters. Uh, I, 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 I implore you to not be led, led away or led astray by, by the words of a few. Investigate for yourself. Learn for yourself. Learn for yourself, you know, Deception, deception is rampant nowadays, and it is the number one killer of the soul of a Christian, is deception, deception. And I'm going to tell you, her books have been nothing but a pure blessing to me, a pure blessing to me. But like I said, let's get to the reason. One of the reasons is, is she calls out her enemies. She calls out her enemies. There's a reason why, why they hate her. There's a reason why they hate her, yet and still... They, 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 they call themselves uplifting her at the same time. Like I said, if you go to the Library of Congress and you ask for a book on the life of Christ, they give an Ellen G. White book. If you, uh, I went to, what I actually did, and I recorded myself one time, I'm going into Books A Million. If you go into any bookstore, they have big long sections of Satanism, occult, witchcraft. I mean, uh, in my uploaded videos, you'll see one of the videos you have to you have to go through the videos for a while, but you'll see where I went into a bookstore with the camera. Not one Ellen G. White book in the occult section, in the witchcraft section. Not one. Matter of fact, the guy in the store told me they are not allowed to sell Ellen G. White books. But you got a whole section on witchcraft. They even had a book book on necromancy, names of demons, uh, uh, the, the the satanic Bible. You got all of these books, but you're not allowed to sell Ellen G. White. Matter of fact, I live in a military town, and I have to go to a different city if I want to purchase some Ellen, Ellen G. White books. They will not even allow the sale of Ellen G. White books in the city that I live in, which is funny and ironic, like I said, because they sell so many demon and witchcraft books that it's, it's beyond, beyond. I'm talking about the section of witchcraft and the, the occult section in the bookstore, any bookstores, Books A Million, uh, what's the name of this other bookstore? Never mind. But I'm talking about the sections is huge. They're huge. Check out my video while I'm in there with the camera. And, and that's why I said, wow, if Ellen G. White is a cult, then the cultists don't know it. <laughs> wow, she, she's not in their section. She's not in their circles. So why really are they painting this tag on her? Why really are they painting this tag on her? Why? Because she calls out the enemy. She was the, it was the great, she wrote a book called The Great Controversy. And this is basically just a history book of Christianity. That's what I'm holding up right here. This is my copy. I like my copy because it has it has pictures. It has pictures to go while you're reading. But this is just a history book of Christianity where the Bible leaves off. The Bible, the book of Revelation was written 40 years after Christ, after the crucif crucifixion of Christ. This book picks up, the great controversy picks up AD 70 when the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem and it tells the history of what happened to the Christian church all the way up 
to the 21st century. And, and why is that important? Because a lot of these things, they, they hate her for writing this book, by the way, because a lot of the things they, they, they try to bury and keep hid are in this book. I'm talking about this, this book is the first place where I learned about Christians having to hide in sewers up under Rome called catacombs. Google catacombs with a C. They had to hide it up in these sewers and they dug and built these elaborate places to live underground. They're still there. They got pictures of them. You can see bunk beds. You can see the kitchen areas. And they were miles of this because there were many Christians that were being persecuted and, and murdered. She talks about the Waldenses, how the uh, Waldenses at one point were the only ones keeping the light, the torch of light, where they hid up in the Alps. And they used to uh, keep the Bible by right, uh, translating the Bible by hand in caves and then coming, disguising themselves as merchants, coming down in the city. And anybody that the Holy Spirit would direct to them, they would uh, give little portions of scripture to. All of this kept the Bible alive when the Roman Catholic Church was trying to stamp out reading any of the Bible. They were trying to stamp out the Bible. And so many of the Waldenses would die, uh, were, were killed, the Huguenots. This book tells the history of it all. Matter of fact, something is just impressed on me. Let me, just reading the, uh, we're going to go through and I'm going to read the chapter, the table of contents, just so you can see what this book about. That, now, this book ain't the only reason, but, but it's what's inside of it. Now, that ain't, that ain't the point of the video. Now, remember, the title is, She Exposed Pope Francis, the Jesuits, and the Illuminati. It was through Ellen White was the first place that I ever heard about a Jesuit. First place I ever heard about a secret society. First place I ever heard about, like I said, about the, like the St. Bartholomew, Bartholomew Massacre that took place in France, where over 70,000 Christians were killed and burned in the course of some nights and in, in just a few very a short very nights you know they were they were killed murdered and slaughtered drug out their home burned on a stake and you know we haven't we haven't witnessed things like this and you know and, and through our history but are we being told these things are we being taught these no these things are being pushed up on the road why because if you don't know your history you'll be doomed to repeat it you'll be doomed to repeat it it was through Ellen White that I first heard about the Spanish Inquisition. And why do I say all these things? Because if she was a Satanist, and, but she's exposing all of these evil agencies and wicked people, then she's not that good of a Satanist. <laughs> she's not that good at all. But anyway, let's look at some of the table of contents for the Great Controversy. Like I said, it starts at AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. And that's the first chapter. The destruction of Jerusalem, persecution in the first centuries, an era of spiritual darkness, the Waldenses, John Wycliffe, John Huss and Jerome, Luther's separation from Rome. Oh yeah, first place I ever heard about Martin Luther, John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation. I never heard about any of these men until I read the Great Controversy. You know, until I read the Great, I wasn't taught about them in school. Yeah, we learned about Europe, but we learned about those homosexual kings, King Henry VIII and you know, they showed us pictures. We had to learn about them and see pictures of them in dresses and makeup. But anyway, Luther before the Diet, the Swiss reformer, Tomat Zwingli, uh, progress of reform in Germany, protests of the princes, the French Reformation, the Netherlands and Scandinavia, later English reformers, the Bible and the French Revolution, the Pilgrim Follows, Follow Fathers, Heralds of the Morning, an American reformer. So all, and, and all of those are just the chapter titles. Wow. Talking about John Wycliffe. That's satanic. Luther, Martin Luther before the diet and worms. That's satanic. Teaching people about John Huss and how he was deceived into coming before this meeting in front of the, the emperor of Rome. And he was end up being burned at the stake. The emperor said, come on, I'll give you a free pass. Come argue with us. You know, because they come talk about the Bible, you know, share your point. You know, they was supposed to set up a big meeting where John Huss would express his beliefs in the Bible and why the Catholic Church was the Antichrist system. And they would have their side, you know, it was set up like a big debate. And they promised him, 
I guess you could say amnesty, nothing would happen to him. But when he got there, they locked him up, threw him in prison, and then they burned him at the stake. I wouldn't know all any of that if I didn't have this book to read. This is why they hate Ellen G. White. This is why you have so many, they say she's a cult and they try to push people away from her to seem crazy. Yes, there are many trolls on the internet. I, when I first started my, this online ministry on the internet, I used to have a lot of them try to come to me, but when they seen that the Holy Spirit will reveal who they are and I would call them out, they, they pretty much would leave me alone. And I know because the title of this video, I'm gonna have some trolls come on here. And what they would do is, you have to be, I'm trying to tell you, you can tell, you can always tell the trolls because they, they, they their whole ministry, it's like their whole YouTube ministry is to talk bad about Adventists, Seven Day Adventists. You know, I'm not even gonna name no names, but you'll you, you, you see them. They say, oh, LNG White exposed, Adventists exposed. Then you go through their videos, and that's all they talk about is how Venice is exposed. I'm like, wow, you ain't even gonna talk about Benny Hinn and how they smoke, smoke, uh, crack cocaine together and heroin. People OD, you know, you got all these religious leaders who are cutting up worldwide, Creflo Dollar asking for something, sixty something million dollars for a private plane. But no, let's talk about Ellen G. White who exposed Jesuits and Spanish Inquisition and told church history. Yeah, let's let's spend all our time talking about that instead of all of these. Uh, men who are deceiving people uh, and leading them astray. But anyway, so so you you see the trolls pop up. They make websites just to talk bad about her. And and okay, and some stuff sounds good to say. Oh, how can she be a prophetess? And this this prop this uh vision didn't come true, or this didn't come true. You know, that's almost like Jonah. You know, it's like Jonah. Certain. Predictions are conditional, based on conditions, based on conditions, on what the other people do, you know, on what the other people do. But anyway, let's get right to it. Let's, I'm, I'm, all I'm going to do is, and I'm going to read some stuff and show you how this woman with a third grade education, I stress that because it's not her. This is the Holy Spirit, and, and the stuff that she writes about the Catholic Church today is nothing but Pope Francis Pope Benedict, Pope John Paul, but it's coming more to light in Francis because I'm going to read about the Jesuits. I'm going to show you what she said about the Jesuits and what she said about the last day popes that would, the papacy that would be in our, our day and time, what she said. So we're going to, we're going to check a little of that out and you, like I say, the truth loves investigation. Stop being so easily led astray with any little word. Investigate for yourself. Look between the lines. Read between the lines. But anyway, it doesn't matter the time. Let's do it. This right here, what I'm about to read now, is chapter 35 in the Great Controversy. And the name, the title of this chapter is Aims of the Papacy. Aims of the Papacy. Aims of the Papacy. It says, Romanism is now regarded by Protestants with far greater favor than in former years. I had to stop right there. I, I'm telling you. Now, she wrote this in the 1800s. Let me lay down the groundwork. She wrote this at a time there was no internet. There, there was no, you know, didn't have, every city didn't have big libraries. Uh, there was no TV. Uh, they, so information was harder to come by. And, and at this time that she wrote this, you know, the, the word like right now, you know, a lot of people are being becoming more wise to the Illuminati, secret societies, what's going on. But at this day and time, the stuff she's saying was like unheard of, like far-fetched, you know. And But she wrote this back in the 1800s. Now, I can see somebody writing this now and people are like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, man, that's... That's good stuff. That's the truth. I feel you. But she wrote this in the 1800s before we had the internet to look up what, you know, what uh, the Bohemian Grove was, before Alice Jones spoke, before all of this. She wrote this. She wrote this. We got to keep that in mind. It is not her. It's the Holy Spirit. Anyway, let me get it. Now remember, okay, Tony Palmer you know, may rest in peace, may sleep quiet. Tony Palmer and Pope Francis just had a big meeting with Kenneth Copeland asking for the end of Protestantism. And they had thousands of leaders 
in the evangelical church present who said, yes, Protestantism is over. We will join hands with Rome. Why did I bring this up? That meeting, keep that meeting in mind with what I'm about to read to you. Thousands of Protestant leaders saying, yes, we will end the Reformation. There is no more Reformation. There is no more Protestant Reformation. We will join hands with Rome again. Now, keep that in mind with this right here. She says, Romanism is now regarded by Protestants with far greater favor than in former years. In those countries where Catholicism is not in the ascendancy, and the papers are taking a conciliatory course in order to gain influence, meaning they're doing whatever they have to do in other countries to gain influence, say like South America, there is an increasing indifference concerning the doctrines that separate the reformed churches from the papal hierarchy. The opinion is gaining ground that after all, we do not differ so widely upon vital points as has been supposed and that a little concession on our part will bring us into a better understanding with Rome. Isn't that what we've been hearing lately? Unity, unity is what God really wants. Put away your doctrinal differences. Isn't that what we're hearing? I heard so many people say that to me, even on the past videos that I've done. Josh, it's not about doctrines. It's not about what you believe. It's about unity. But anyway, with a better understanding with Rome, the time was when Protestants placed a high value upon the liberty of conscience, meaning the freedom to believe how you want to believe. That used to be one of the main points of the Reformation, is that we have the freedom to believe how we want to believe. And people, what the Catholic Church has, i got to say, geniusly kept hid from out of history and people is that that is one of the things that they stood against. The Catholic Church has always stood against the liberty of conscience. They have always stood against the freedom for you to think how you want to think and worship how you want to worship. Anyway, let me get back. Okay. The time was when Protestants placed a high value upon the liberty of conscience, which had been so dearly purchased. They taught their children to abhor popery and held that to seek harmony with Rome would be disloyalty to God. I gotta read that one time, one more time. Because she's talking about the, the Protestants of old. Now she wrote this in the 1800s. They taught their children to abhor, abhor popery and held that to seek harmony with Rome would be disloyalty to God. But how widely different are the sentiments now expressed? The defenders of the papacy declare that the church has been maligned. She was done wrong. And the Protestant world are inclined to accept this statement. Many people are it's like she saw it's like she saw the Pope Francis and Kenneth Copeland meeting and the, the, all the leaders of the uh, Protestant church meeting together this past year. Many urge that it is unjust to judge the church of today by the abominations and absurdities that marked her reign during the centuries of ignorance and darkness. They excuse her horrible cruelty as the result of the barbarianism of the times and plead that the influence of modern civilization has changed her sentiments. Basically, they're saying that the, the 50 million to 200 million uh, Protestants that they killed and that's just the number that they know there are many that were murdered and slaughtered when they had because this this all happened when there was no records to keep when there was no records to keep so they're basically saying that even though she killed over 200 million Christians and so on and so many people now are coming out saying that's not true because people don't read their history even Pope John John Paul apologize for the church. You can Google that. Please Google it. Before you say, Josh, you know, get on here and leave me a comment saying that's not true. The Catholic Church didn't murder all them people. Even Pope John apologized for what the church did in her past and how many people they killed and slaughtered. So please, that's out of his mouth. So if you don't believe me, at least believe the person that you're under. And, and I want to say this first before I go on. I am not talking about the people, the, the Catholic, because they are sincere Catholics. I'm talking about the system. So I'm not talking about, I'm not making light or making fun of the people who are Catholic and who worship and who grew up in the Catholic Church. I'm pleading for my brother, because they're still my brothers and sisters, and I'm pleading for 
I'm pleading for them to study for themselves. Investigate. Do the history on your religion. Know what you're in. Know what you're affiliated with. Before you, you know, as you as you claim, as you take on the title, do your homework to whose title you're carrying. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. Because like I said, they're sincere Catholic believers who are better in character, say, as, as me and other people who say we have the truth. Because everybody says they have the truth. But there are people who, who might be in error, who might not understand fully what they believe or the history of their church. But they are good people. They don't have a temper. They don't curse. They don't drink. They are good people. They just don't know the truth. But anyway, anyway. Have these persons forgotten the claim of inf infallibility? That means inf where it says the Catholic Church has always claimed infallibility, mean she doesn't err, she doesn't make mistakes. So basically saying, uh, the, the, when Pope John apologized for the church killing all those millions of Protestants, he bet that was a smoke screen because the church lives by infallibility, meaning they don't make mistakes. What they do is what they do, and then they don't apologize for it. Have these persons forgotten the claim of infallibility put forth put forth for 800 years by this haughty power? So far from being relinquished, this claim was affirmed in the 19th century with greater positiveness than ever before. As Rome asserts that the church never erred, nor will it, according to the scriptures, will ever err, will ever err. The papal church will never relinquish her claim of infallibility. And, and for those who might go here and say, the church doesn't believe that. The church never said, never erred. That's taken actually from a, a, a Catholic book. John L. Von Moschine, the name, that's who wrote the book. And it's called Institutes of Ecclesiastical History. Book 3, Century 2, Part 2, Chapter 2, Section 9. Sounds like one of them books I really don't want to read. Anyway... The papal church will never relinquish her claim of infallibility. All that she has done in her persecution of those who reject her dogmas, she holds to be right. And would, and would she not repeat the same acts should the opportunity be presented? Don't they, don't they say, and I, I said it earlier, doesn't history repeat itself? Especially when we don't, when we don't know our history, doesn't it always repeat itself? Let the restraints, now she said this in the 1800s, check this out, this is a important statement right here, but she says, let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be removed and Rome will be reinstated in her former power and there would be speedily a revival of her tyranny and persecution. Let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be removed and Rome be reinstated in her former power and there would speedily be a revival of her tyranny and persecution. That is what we're seeing today. Was not Pope Francis lifted up as the world's spiritual leader? Really? He's a Jesuit, but... The reason why they can do that is because we don't know what Jesuits are. They have kept the history of what a Jesuit is out of the history books. And if, but if you want to study, it's all right there. The Jesuits before and even up to the 17th, 17th century, 1800s, were banned from all the countries they were ever in. They were banned and, and a lot of these men were murdered because there was no hiding of their evil intentions to bring the world back to Rome. Even Google what Abraham Lincoln and Sam Madison said about the Jesuits. But now we have our first Jesuit Pope and we praise this man. Why? Because we people don't study no more. We don't know our history of a Jesuit. And like I said, that's why they keep books like The Great Controversy. They don't want you to read it. Because like I said, it was in that book that I first heard what a Jesuit is. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to read the first thing I ever heard what a Jesuit was. I'm going to read this first quote. This is the first quote. When I read this out of the Great Controversy, I was blown away because I was like, who is these people? <laughs> I was like, wow, what the what? You know, when you read something, you're like, what? Who are these people? 
and, and, and now we have a Jesuit Pope, the most powerful man in the world. Why? Because like I, like I stress and I stress it, we have stopped studying for ourselves. We have stopped studying for ourselves. This is why they hate Ellen G. White. For what I like what I just read you, and for like what I'm about to read you, this is why they hate Ellen White. <clears throat> she wrote, and this is page 235 in the Great Controversy. Page 235 in the Great Controversy, paragraph 2. She wrote, throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created. The most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery, cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection. I mean, these men would do whatever, whatever. Dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscience wholly silence they knew no rule no tie but that of their order and no duty but to extend its power the gospel of christ had enabled its adherents to meet danger and endure suffering undismayed by cold hunger toil and poverty to uphold the banner of truth in face of the rack the dungeon and the stake to combat these forces, Jesuitism inspired its followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers and to oppose to the power of truth all weapons of deception. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vow, now doesn't this sound like Pope Francis? Listen to these words. Tell me this isn't Pope Francis. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility. That's what so many people say about Pope Francis. Oh, he lived in a little bu a bedroom apartment. He drove a little bug. This cute little bug. He's the coolest Pope ever. He's so humble. Listen. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility. It was their studied aim to secure wealth and power. To be devoted to overthrow the overthrow of Protestantism and the reestablishment of papal supremacy. Now, before I continue reading, because this next, this next is all Pope Francis all day. Before I keep reading, we I want to say we, we we have to understand why is it so important we understand what a Jesuit is. It's for that last saying, that last line that she wrote. They were created. To stamp out Protestantism. Let's put two and two together, y'all. So when Pope Francis and, and Tony Palmer had this meeting to do away, saying, what, how did Tony Palmer put? Can I use what Tony Palmer voice? He said, maybe the Reformation is over. He said, maybe the Reformation is over. There is no more. You are all Catholics now. You're all Catholics now. This was strategically done. Because that is their aim to do away with Protestantism, period. This was strategically done. And excuse me for making light of Tony Palmer because he, he, he did die. And I believe that was strategically done. Because no better yet to, for a cause than for a cause to have a martyr. They have this big meeting with all the evangelicals. And Pope Francis, which made history of the Protestant church saying, yes, we're not Protestants anymore. We're all Catholics. Let's hold hands with Rome. The best way to keep a movement going and to add fire to that movement, somebody has to be a martyr. But is he really dead? Is he really dead? I'm going to throw that question out there, too. I say excuse me just out of, out of respect that he might be dead, but is he really dead? I'm gonna leave that up in there because there, there's some proof out there that he's not, but that's that's beyond hearsay. I'm uh let's get back to thing. But so that meeting was no coincidence. The aim of a Jesuit Jesuit created to stamp out Protestantism, point blank period. So guess what the aim of Pope Francis is? To stamp out Protestantism. One way to do that first is to gain your love, your favor, 
and your affection. It's hard for you to see a smack coming if it's coming from the person you like and love. Just remember that. All right, I'm going to finish. Page 235 in The Great Controversy. She says, when appearing as members of their order, this is Pope Francis, when appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prisons and hospitals, ministering to the sick and the poor, professing to have renounced the world and bearing the sacred name of Jesus, who went about doing good, but under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. Basically meaning it don't they believe in when it says the end justifies the means, basically they're saying this, okay, that's the goal. It doesn't matter what we do to get to that goal. Even if we got a like the St. Bartholomew Massacre, if we got to burn little children, burn little children and leave their ashes in the streets, so be it. We have to reach our goal. That is how the Jesuits think. That is how the Jesuits think. And didn't Pope Francis reveal, because if you start to listen, you know, a wolf can only stay hid as a sheep for so long. What did he say about if somebody offends his mother or says something, did he say he'll punch him in the face? Now this is supposed to be a representative of God. He talking about punching somebody in the face? But are we just going to close our eyes to that? Oh, that's all right. This is a ho supposed to be a holy man. Talking about punching somebody in the face over a little word? Over talking about your mama? What if every little kid in America did that one day? Said, okay, anybody who talks about our mama, it was a worldwide thing. And all the little kids said, if anybody talk about my mama, we fighting. It'll be fights in every school, every daycare across the country. Why? from listening to Pope Francis. Pope Francis done sparked a little kid rebellion over saying it's okay to punch somebody in the face for talking about their mama. Even little kids know that ain't right. But anyway, let me get back to it. Let's get back to it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back up one line. But under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly person purposes were often concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable, but commendable when they served the interests of the church. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be the counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. They became servants to act as spies upon their masters. They established colleges. She wrote this in the 1800s. Don't, don't we have Loyola, named after Ignatius Loyola, who, who started the Jesuits? Georgetown University, they say, is a Jesuit university. Mm. They established colleges for the sons of princes and nobles and schools for the common people and the children of Protestant parents were drawn into an observance of popish rites. All the outward pomp and display of the Roman worship was brought to bear to confuse the mind and dazzle and captivate the imagination and thus the liberty for which the fathers had toiled and bled was betrayed by the sons. I gotta say that one more time. And thus the liberty for which the fathers had toiled and bled for was betrayed by the sons. The Jesuits rapidly spread themselves over Europe, and wherever they went, there followed a revival of popery. To give them, to give them greater power, a bull was issued reestablishing the Inquisition. Please Google the Spanish Inquisition if you do not know what that is. If you do not know what that is. Notwithstanding the general abhorrence with which it was regarded, even in Catholic countries, this terrible tribunal was again set up by the popish rulers and atrocities too terrible to bear the light of, the light of day, were repeated in its secret dungeons. In many countries, thousands upon thousands of the very flower of the nation, the purest and noblest, the most intellectual and highly educated, pious and devoted pastors, industrious and patriotic citizens, brilliant scholars, talented artists, skillful artisans were slain or forced to flee 
to other lands. Trust me, if you do not know about the Spanish Inquisition, just Google, do your homework. Which Rome had invoked to quench the light of the Reformation, to withdraw from men the Bible. This was over the Bible, y'all. To withdraw from men the Bible and to restore the ignorance and superstition of the dark ages. But under God's blessing and the labors of those noble men whom he had raised up to succeed Luther and before Luther, like John Huss, because now they try to say that Luther is Luther's Reformation. No, the Reformation. Okay, y'all, my camera just died on me without any warning. Like I said, the enemy, the devil definitely doesn't want this spoke about. Uh, but like I said, there were, like I left off, there were many men before Martin Luther, uh, from the Waldenses to the Huguenots, uh, John Huss, uh, Jerome, you know. Uh, so they, they try to say John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, saying so many men who, and women and children who bled and died just so we could have our Bible and just so we could worship freely to what we believe. And this is why they hate Ellen G. White because, like I say, her book, The Great Controversy, tells a lot of this history that they wish they could have kept buried. But we're dealing with God. <laughs> You're going to lose. I mean, that's point blank, period. I'm not even going to sugarcoat it. I'm not even, as the Hebrew boys told Nebuchadnezzar, I'm not even careful how I answer you. You're going to lose. But anyway, let me finish reading what she says about Jesuits. But under God's blessing and the labors of those noble men whom he had raised up to succeed Luther, Protestantism was not overthrown. Not to the favor of, not to the favor or arms of princes was it to owe its strength. The smallest countries, the humblest and least powerful nations became its strongholds. It was little Geneva in the midst of mighty foes plotting her destruction. It was, it was Holland on her sandbanks by the northern sea wrestling against the tyranny of Spain. Then the greatest and most opulent of kingdoms, it was bleak, sterile Sweden that gained victories for the Reformation. I would have never known that. I would have never, I, these things like, I'll never forget the story. I often speak of this story about uh i believe it was scandinavia you know as 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 rome set out the decree you know you can't be reading your bibles don't you better not be reading your bibles and then they just said you got to stop preaching the word all together a lot of the adults stopped preaching a lot of the adults quit stopped and once that happened the holy spirit fell on the children and the children stood up and started preaching and that was a rebuke to the adults. And then the adults started back up a revival. But the children started, they picked up where the adults were too afraid to do. Just like David, when, when, when David went to take his brothers some food and meal while they're at war, and David sees all the adults and the grown-ups run off. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David was a child. He was a boy. All the adults and mighty men of Israel fled and were afraid. David was the only one who stood firm. But like the situation in Scandinavia, I would have never known that if Ellen White didn't allow the Holy Spirit to use her. So all I'm saying is, is investigate for yourself. Don't just believe everything you hear. Don't believe there's a reason why certain people are blackballed by our government. There's a reason. And there's a reason why all of these corrupt ministers and people are so flourishing and people push them, oh, the purpose-driven life. But yet, and still, he admits he talks to a medium. Hmm. He admits he talks to, to, to spirits. But we, we hold these people as men and women of God. Hmm. Beloved, the truth loves investigation the truth loves investigation investigate for yourself investigate for yourself like i said this i would have never known what a jesuit was until i read the great controversy i want to read this i got to read that top line again because 
we are so fooled by Pope Francis. Oh, he's so cool. He's so laid back, you know. And she wrote this in the 1800s. The 1800s. Screwing back up. All right. Let me see. Cut off from earthly ties. Right here. Okay, okay, okay. I went up too high. Bear with me, bear with me. Bear. Okay. When appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prisons and hospitals, ministering to the sick and the poor, professing to have renounced the world and bearing the sacred name of Jesus, who went about doing good. But under this blandness exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. By this, it was the fundamental principle the, by the order that the end justifies the mean. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable but commendable when they served the interests of the church. When they served the interests of the church. Mm. I want to talk about what she, she talks about their mind. Okay, I can't find it. I can't find it. Okay, here it is. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created. The most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Of all the champions of popery. I love it. Once you do your homework on Jesuits, like I say, they were banned. They were banned from all nations. They were banned, but we accept them today because we don't know our history. We don't know who they are. Just look up Adam Weishaupt. Adam Weishaupt was the 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 the, the head of the Bavarian Lodge, and when they found in Bavaria, and when they found him, they burnt down the lodge, and and they had to flee. Adam Weishaupt and all the other little Jesuits then had to flee. So he fled over here to America, to this new country, to this new country, and that's when he knew. Okay, the name Jesuit. Is, is real dirty right now, so let's change our name. That's when he changed it to Freemason. Freemason. <sighs> Come on, beloved. Are uh, my fingers, my fingers might be different. They might be solo up top, but aren't they connected to my body? Isn't my nose, even though my nose is different from my finger, aren't they connected to my body? What I'm saying is just because it has a different name doesn't mean it's not connected. To the same body. Y'all have a good one.